The story began in 1991 when a group of most experienced divers decided to dive into Indian Springs Cave in Florida. This was supposed to be a series of dives, but the first one was one of the most terrifying diving experiences in the last 30 years. In Florida, we can find a place named the Woodville Karst Plain that goes from Tallahassee, Florida, right into the Gulf of Mexico. This place is famous as a karst landscape made with limestone and other soluble rocks that take up about 400 square miles to about 1,000 square kilometers. Rain and flowing water can easily dissolve soft limestone, so it has gradually shaped the rock. Thanks to this erosion in the karst landscapes, there are a lot of cave systems, small subterranean rivers, cliffs above the ground, and sinkholes underneath. The Woodville Karst Plain has the most extensive system of underwater caves in the United States. There are several entrances, one of them being Indian Springs, a simple pond you could easily walk past. It's situated in Wakula County and leads into a cave system with the same name, which is at least two miles or about 3.2 kilometers long and at least 300 feet, about 91 meters deep. It was decided that in 1991, on November 17th, there would be a dive as part of the Woodville Karst Plains Project. For this, a team of the best, the most accomplished, and competent divers were recruited. The team members had already excelled in time spent underwater and going to the deepest caves. This particular dive was going to be the first of the whole plan and the one to give some new information. They had been organizing everything for this exploration for about two years. So they planned out a certain decompression schedule as they were going so deep that it was absolutely necessary. One of the team members was George Irvine, an extremely experienced diver. He had quite the record with almost a thousand technical dives, and this was going to be his 77th cave dive. And although he had all this experience, Diving still sometimes terrified him. Whenever he managed to get back to the surface and see the sunlight with the scenery around, he felt a tremendous feeling of relief. This was also his most crucial dive with such a big significance. Basically, they spent months improving their plan, and as a trial run to get back on track, they decided to have the first expedition with all the members. Parker Turner, one of the two main explorers, established some roles for everyone so that everyone had their tasks. The group was divided into three teams. The first task for team number one would be to set down one set of gas bottles. As for the second team, with George and another diver, they would have to put down another set of bottles for travel over. And finally, the third team consisted of Parker Turner and Bill Gavin, who would finish the journey. Bill was involved in the initial trip related to the discovery of the tracks, and any crew left would serve as ground support. That was the so-called technical diving, so they needed two mixtures of gases. During the traverse, it was a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Then, at the deepest point, they would change to a mixture of oxygen, helium, and nitrogen to lessen the effects of nitrogen narcosis which essentially happens when certain ordinary gases have a narcotic effect under high pressure. On November 17th, the group got to Indian Springs, ready to go down. It is actually a small pond in a clearing with trees all around it. There is a wooden pier leading to the shore and even a small dock in the middle. So team number one went under the water, got to the bottom, and then to the cave entrance. After that, Team number two followed the same path, with Parker and Bill right behind them going into the water. The task of the first and second teams was to place all the necessary equipment. And as they would be leaving, Bill and Parker would only be going down. It takes approximately 40 minutes to traverse the area where the leads were discovered. Then exploring the 300-foot area would probably take them 25 minutes, and it would take another 40 minutes to leave. There is also a cave at the bottom of the pond, which eventually merges into Indian Springs Cave. The cave leads to a tunnel that stretches hundreds of feet into a place named the Squaw's Restriction. The cave here is so narrow that only one diver in his gear can go through it. It then leads to a series of meandering yellow and white limestone tunnels. 
Fortunately, since the caves are so popular, there are fixed lines for almost the whole length. These lines help to guide the diver when it's hard to see. Bill and Parker trek through winding tunnels until they manage to reach a huge chamber known as the Wakula Room. After 63 minutes of exploring around, they decided to go back. Unfortunately for them, a terrifying once-in-a-lifetime event in diving history happened. Going back, they got their nitrox tanks. Bill also ensured he had enough gas in the bottles on his back. During this time, Parker gestured to Bill that his underwater scooter was dying. So, Bill decided to pull them together and use his own scooter. They were only about 1,500 feet, or almost 460 meters, from the entrance at that moment, so it was not a big problem, even if this could drain his battery faster. Finally, they reached a prominent arrow on a line at about 500 feet, or 150 meters, from the entrance. On the way in, Bill thought they reached this mark about 105 minutes after the dive, so they went exactly as planned. Then they headed left after the marker and found it much harder to see. While they were relatively careful going in, they might just have kicked some silt, so they weren't too concerned. They moved on and saw that the ground was now completely obscured by a cloud of silt. Fortunately, they noticed that the line went up in the ceiling, but the visibility was getting much worse as they went in. Eventually, Due to poor visibility, they had to stop using scooters and switch to the following line. The line got lost in the sand when they came into the area of supposed squaw's restrictions. They decided to pull the line out of the sand, but it was so deep down that it turned out to be impossible. They found just a ton of sand where there was squaw's restriction. That made it impossible to see further than a foot. They had to return and get rid of their scooters and stage bottles but the stage bottles were almost empty, so they returned to the tanks on their backs. They didn't know what to do, so they needed time to think through everything. They knew for sure that there had been two lines, the one they were following and another one. So they decided to check it, but it was also buried under the sand. This made no sense at all. About five minutes earlier, as George and his companion surpassed Squaw's restriction, the water was dashing past them, and at the bottom of the cave, there was a real sandstorm. At first, George thought his scooter was probably somehow on, and it was just slamming around. However, what had happened was that as the divers were decompressing, they created lots of bubbles that changed the rock's buoyancy at the cave ceiling. Now, heavier rocks fell from the top, causing a mudslide towards Squaw's restriction absolutely burying it. And as Bill and Parker returned, they couldn't get out of Indian Springs. Scrambling to find a way out, Bill connected his reel to the line on the other side of Squaw's restriction. He couldn't see for sure due to the awful visibility, as everything seemed covered by sand and stones. But he still had no idea what was going on or whether he even came to where he wanted. Finally, he noticed a little current, so he started chasing it. But looking around for a while, he wondered if they were really at Squaw's restriction, or if they accidentally went the wrong way. Bill decided to go back about 300 feet and recheck the arrow, as Parker was still looking for a way out. When Bill finally found the arrow, he just kept looking at it to ensure they didn't make any mistakes and followed it correctly. Once he ensured they made no mistakes, he returned to Parker. For the next almost 45 minutes, the two of them were desperately trying to look for any exit while their gas was rapidly running out. So as soon as Bill and Parker finally looked at their pressure gauges, they saw they had very little gas left. That was when Parker wrote, what do we do? on his slate and gave it to Bill. Parker clearly wanted the more experienced Bill to know what to do. But unfortunately, at this point, Bill had no idea as well. He could only say one thing. Wait, I'll take a look. As he got his reel onto the main line, he went to search around again. After about five minutes, he got nowhere once again. 
so he decided to go back. As soon as he got back, he couldn't see Parker anywhere. Bill got a stage bottle to take a few deep breaths while still thinking about what to do. He only had air for a couple of minutes and a tank on his back when the stage bottle was empty. About four minutes later, there was no air in the stage bottle. Parker still hadn't returned and was literally less than 10 minutes from drowning. He started desperately looking around again. That was when he found a line that led to the main line. He was so panicked he couldn't understand where it was coming from, but having no other choice, Bill followed it. That's when he saw a small opening. Inside was the second layer of the regulator, and due to the panic, he didn't realize why it was there. He released the controller and saw a line rising almost straight up. Then, practically breathless, he swam to the next set of bottles at 100 feet, 30 meters, as fast as he could. He barely managed to get to the next set of bottles, just holding his breath. And even though he got the air, he felt no relief. Parker was nowhere in sight. Those bottles were the ones Parker had to use. At that moment, Bill knew that Parker didn't make it. That's when Bill could clearly see that the regulator and line he had followed were Parker's. And the only reason he couldn't find his body was because of all the sand that made it hard to see. Parker's body was still somewhere out there, floating. And thus, he just stayed there waiting for when support divers would get him. On the surface, water levels got lower by a foot or so. This happened because of all the new space which appeared after rocks and sand were displaced. Then, as sand blocked Squaw's restriction, it actually stopped. Also, before it got blocked, the current moved the silt to the other side of the area. All this made water for George and other divers quite clear. They had no clue what was going on. George was puzzled as to why his scooter was right where he had left it. That's when one would assume that the team on the surface would start to think something was wrong, seeing the water level dropping. But actually, water in caves and springs frequently rises and lowers. It is unknown why, but sometimes water currents are quicker there, lowering water levels. So it's not as rare as you would think. We know about cases of whole lakes disappearing and reappearing. There's even a well-known lake like that in Florida, Lake Jackson, that can stay without water for years. But after some time, George and his partners started to get a little concerned as they saw silt was coming back. The first team had already been out, at about 20 feet or around 6 meters under the water. However, George still wanted to go back to see if everything was okay. He went down to about 110 feet, or almost 34 meters, and all he could see seemed pretty normal. The bottles were fine, but unfortunately he couldn't see that far to notice that Squaw's restriction was a completely different shape. The silt he saw was actually the cave reopening, and all the silt from the other side was returning. Thinking all was well, he swam back to the surface, where he and his partner eventually got out. But his partner looked quite terrified not feeling too good about what was happening. He wanted to know if George saw Bill or Parker. George said no, but thought everything was fine as the bottles were still there. Another support diver then stuck his head out of the water and wondered if all was well, and if George had visual contact with team number three. He agreed, adding that he saw Bill and Parker even waved at him. The support diver got concerned, saying that the one waving was him. That was when they all knew something went wrong, so the support diver went back down. After two minutes, he came back, explaining that Parker's tanks were still on the line and that he and his partner were nowhere to be seen. After that, they both dove back in. As it was almost impossible to see in that section, they followed the line closely. Desperately trying to find the two, they started the search. After some time, George actually bumped into someone who turned out to be Bill. He was sitting, paralyzed. George started to examine him, seeing that he was breathing and still had gas. And during all that time, Bill was just sitting there, paying no attention to what was happening around him. Later, 
he got out his plate and wrote that Parker was dead. George felt a shiver going through him. He froze, not understanding the whole meaning of what was written. When he finally came back to his senses, he realized Bill was probably in a state of shock. So George had to make sure Bill went through the whole process of decompression with enough air for him to breathe. He tried to explain this to Bill, but he was so deeply overwhelmed that he couldn't comprehend anything. There was no way George could actually move him, and Bill didn't want to know if he had enough gas to stay alive. Finally, George tied a reel so that they could find Bill later and swam to the surface to tell the others. As he got out, after he found some power, he broke the news about Parker's death. He shouted to the others that someone had to go back and get Bill because he was motionless. He told the support diver how to find him. Without delay, another diver got his tank and was back in the water. They ended up moving him from his position to a better one, where he decompressed for about four hours due to the extra time he spent down there. During this time, Bill told them as much as he could. He said he didn't know if anyone else was anywhere to be found or how much of the cave was gone. Luckily, he resurfaced completely fine with no symptoms of decompression sickness, as it turned out they hadn't been too deep. And at the same time, George tried to find Parker's body using the main line. But unfortunately, that day, after about nine attempts, he ran out of gas without finding his friend. As he went up, he completely forgot to decompress, resulting in minor decompression sickness. After a while, police and other people came into the area. Some divers suggested that Parker found an air pocket at the cave ceiling, but George denied the suggestion as it was too deep where he was. They had to explain to the police that they couldn't get him out today as they didn't have enough gas, so they would come back the next day to find his body. Two team members drove to Parker's house and told his wife the news, while others went to refill the gas tanks. Bill sat in his van outside the house, trying to calm himself. The next morning, they all went to Indian Springs, where they planned to get Parker. After a while, the police arrived, saying that divers had already retrieved the body at around 6 p.m. that day. It was Parker who taught the police in that area how to dive and how to retrieve bodies. He actually had a lot of friends there who didn't want to let him stay in the water for longer than necessary. After careful examination and research, divers thought they knew what had happened. Basically, when Bill left, Parker felt the current. He found a small hole from which the water was coming. As he was almost out of air, he took his tank off and tied his safety spool to the main line. He tried to pass the hole, dragging his tanks, but unfortunately, he couldn't get to the decompression tanks. As he lost consciousness, he floated to the ceiling of the cave. Squeezing through, he made the hole a little bigger, allowing Bill to pass with his tanks on. Even his tanks fell into a perfect position to guide Bill out. Thanks to all of that, Bill was able to actually make it out alive. In one of the papers of 2015, it was stated that this was the only casualty in cave diving history that occurred because of natural causes. Unfortunately, some divers don't know about the effect of decompression and how important this is in cave systems. After what happened that day, most of the divers from the team stopped practicing. George and Bill didn't dive for a long time, and only after a while they started returning to their old passion, little by little. At some point, George invited Bill to go to Mexico for cave diving. In an interview for a film about the Woodville Karst Plains project, Bill said that there was not a day when he didn't think about Parker. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. Hope to see you in the next video. Bye.